Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Noel from the Marion Library Service, and thank you for joining us for our Library Through the Lens live webinar with special guest author Annette Marna, who is in conversation today with author Joe Case. Our Library Through the Lens series of adult programs, delivered differently, enables us to still connect and engage with you during these unprecedented circumstances we find ourselves in. Today, award winning poet and novelist Annette will chat about her book, A New Name for the Colour Blue which is influenced by Annette's decades of reporting on male violence towards women and girls as a former current affairs broadcaster with ABC Radio. Please feel free during the presentation to type any questions you would like to ask Annette or Joe into the Q&A text box on your screen and time permitting, I will ask these at the end of her talk. Annette's book can be purchased online through our webinar bookseller partner, Imprints Booksellers, who can offer delivery and can be found online at imprints.com.au. Now sit back, relax, and please welcome Annette Marner and Joe Case. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be chatting to you about your book, Annette. I've just spent a, a very relaxing Easter weekend outside enjoying it, which I think is the best place to do it. Um, to read a book um, that's so immersed in the natural world. Um, and that's um, maybe where we might um, start the discussion. Um, your narrator, Cassandra, says that she wants to be an artist who was also a naturalist, who could look deeply into the unfolding stories of the Australian landscape. And I can see this philosophy reflected in a new name for the colour blue. I wondered if you could talk a bit about how that approach uh, describes your writing as well and your connection to the natural world and to the, the Flinders Ranges that you write about. Well, I grew up in the Southern Flinders and from the time I came into consciousness, I had, um, a, it was a really rich interior life that I had and wandering around the bush, my parents were gorgeous. They just let me wander about <laughs> and um, I felt, that some of my best friends when I was really little were trees. Mm. I know some of our fellow country people may well understand this. It, it may seem strange for people that have not had that relationship. Um, Alice Walker talks about it in, um, in The Colour Purple, about if a tree is harmed, you feel like your own body is bleeding. Mm. That is a, an extreme form of it, mm. but nevertheless, Many of us have very, very rich um, uh, relationships, communications with the natural world. Mary Oliver, many people may know the work of Mary Oliver, the American Pulitzer poet, prize winning poet. And she talks about it as well, how the natural world saved her over and over as a child. Well, for me, it was a presence. That's probably the best way I can describe it. An illuminating presence that enriched every moment of my life. And in those times as I was growing up, coming into consciousness, five, six, seven years of age, um, and being brought up as a Catholic, the best way I could describe it, well, the Catholic Church gave me a framework for it, and that was the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. so, but however you want to call it, whatever you want to call it, for me, it was very real. And that was just the name that I took on because I was being brought up a Catholic. If I'd <laughs> been brought up a Buddhist, it would have had another name. I'm, I'm just trying to explain the, the depth of the aliveness and richness of that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. So you felt a spirituality with your surrounds, with the, the nature around you, but you kind of used the framework of the Catholic Church as, to describe it. Is that right? Because I did, yeah, well, yes, because I didn't have any language. Yes. So when the Catholic Church told me, oh, this is what it would be, well, I thought, oh, okay, that's what it must be. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you grow up and you, you understand other cultures and other approaches and you realise that, you know, um, uh, wherever you are on the planet, it will probably get a different name. But the, the concept is the same. And yeah. it is a living, luminous presence that, that can really touch you and in those moments when you feel so much of your life is um, the way you want it and you're coming to terms with the reality of disappointment or grief or whatever it may be, there is something, uh, there's something very powerful about that connection with the natural world. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, for example, the Australian Conservation Foundation said, had a question online and they said, 
why is conservation important to you? And I wrote 20 different answers and they were, none of them were good enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had about two or three sentences to do it in. <laughs> that sounds like a literary writer's approach. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up writing nothing. <laughs> it's interesting but, when you talk about um, about connecting with the landscape around you as a child and particularly um, pinning that to the ages of around six or seven because that really comes out in the novel with your narrator Cassandra um, seeking solace but also company from the, the world around her like she she's really connected to the bird life to she spends time watching the um, the rosellas um, and the glass on on farm and she has a very different connection to them than the rest of her family. For example, her father and her brothers who see them as, as pests. They've got a real farmer's relationship to their surrounds, whereas um, Cassandra has more of a, um, a personal relationship. So I guess, is have you brought some of your own personal experience there to your, um, to your narrator, Cassandra? I suppose in some ways, um, some writers say that they mine their personal lives mm. <laughs> to create their books. I see it more like a, um, a fruit smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> so you might put in a, a couple of blueberries that might be something that um, was actually from your own life but then it is distorted and it's added with so many other things. What you, the final product has all sorts of other ingredients in it yeah. and you can't even see that the blueberries are there anymore. So for me, it's a bit like that. Mm. Um, I always had this idea from the time I was five or six years of age and started to write poetry. I, um, and then I knew that you could write longer stories. I knew from a very young age that I wanted to write about that kind of relationship with the landscape. Mm -hmm. And when I took my novel to Flinders Uni as my master's and then it turned into a PhD, one of the things I looked at in non-Indigenous writing was how did we as non-Indigenous people describe Australian landscape? You mm -hmm. know, what was the relationship like? And what I noticed, and it's a bit like, you know, the red pill in the matrix, once you start to see it, you can't <laughs> unsee it. Yeah. And what I started to see is that so many of us, <clears throat> and possibly unconsciously, uh, when we write about the Australian landscape, the references are things like, oh, the cockatoos are at the fruit trees again, mm. or they're pecking at the fence, or there's a flood, or there's a fire, or everything is a nuisance. And we have this incredible tension with the natural world in Australia. And the whole book really is about how do we work through, how do we first of all identify that tension, this mm -hmm. unease that so many of us have in the Australian landscape, that we see it as either it's a business, but we don't recognise the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. We tend to have this approach that it's all about business, that the forest has no economic value until it's cut down and then we measure it as GDP, but it's not measured in GDP or our national accounts while it's still as a forest. It's only becomes measurable in our national accounts as it's been cut down and used for something else. So there, we brought as European migrants to this country in the early days, the first years of colonizations, this sense that we had to survive. My ancestors had to survive. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But what is our position now is the question. Mm -hmm. And do we still have this strained and tense relationship with our own landscape? And how can we ever call it home while we still view it only as a business? Or if we all are always at war with it. So we have war on locusts, war on corellas, this is the kind of language that infiltrates the public discourse. So that's what I saw when I started to look at many wonderful and brilliant Australian writers. And I think it's actually part of our psyche that we brought up with this kind of culture, that we're uneasy here. Mm. And I wanted to say, because I felt as a child and I saw other writers around the world. And I, when I read people like Kim Scott, an indigenous writer in Australia, you don't see that kind of tension in his work, mm. you know? And I thought, well, what's my role as a 
non-Indigenous writer, as someone who, who has had this relationship with the landscape, what if I explored that and put it on the page? Mm. So that's and, what I tried to do. No, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, and and I think uh, one one uh, there's there's one uh, one element that I thought really um, captures this kind of tension uh, in terms of looking at the natural world through a colonial um, viewpoint and reframing that as well. Um, before we move on to talking to, about some of the other themes in the book, of which there are many, I wonder if you could perhaps talk about this example of the she-oak, which is uh, both uh, something that Cassandra has a real connection with these she-oaks on her land. They have um, multiple meaning, but also um, when she's talking to her Indigenous friend, Kristen, she talks about the actual, the language of what she-oak means, um, which yes. speaks to another theme in the book. So I wonder if you can talk about that. Um, that's a really interesting thing. This is actually what really happened to me in the year 1986. And I'd always loved the she oak. There's so many, um, I love grey box trees as well and so many others, but I, I love the she oak. And one day I just thought, I wonder how it got its name. <laughs> so off I went, I was working as a community arts officer in 1986 in Port Perry. So I and looked it up and I was so horrified by the by the what I found that um, I knew it would be integrated into the book. I don't want to give too much away because it's okay. a really important part of the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> but can you perhaps tell us what it means, which kind of has speaks to the gender element? Of... Um, okay, um, so how can I put it without giving too much away? I'll have to think about this some more. Um, so we can skip it if you. <laughs> We can just say, look out for it. Read the book and look out for it. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I have to say that. Look out for that because it's really, really important. And it does point to a kind of um, powerful misogyny that has underscored our culture in Australia. And mm. maybe I'll just leave it at that, Joe. if you'll forgive me for not elaborating further. No, I'll <laughs> it's forgive you. It's a really important part of the book. So... <laughs> So but what I can say that when I was doing my, I, my um, supervisor, Jerry Kroll, said, now, Annette, what's this novel all about? And I actually told her the full story and what I'd discovered. And she said, how long have you kept that to yourself? And I said, 20 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, so, you have been writing the book for a long time. I have. So hence my reluctance just a wee bit today to share too much because I don't want to take away some of the power of the narrative for our readers. Sure. Okay, well, you can just stop me like that whenever okay. I bring up something that might be a spoiler, so I will try not to. Okay. Um, so missing children are at the heart of this novel. Um, right from the beginning, that is a theme. You know, for instance, um, Cassandra's partner, uh, partner at the beginning of the novel is in a band called City of Searchers, um, because Adelaide is so renowned for lost children. Um, and you draw a parallel at one point between the nationwide search for the Beaumont children and the silent disappearance of Cassandra's Indigenous best friend, Tanya Pepper, when they're both children, um, which kind of foreshadows the book. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a bit about that, that um, disparity between uh, whose disappearances we really notice and, and who is counted and who is not. Yeah, it, it's one of the, uh, it's integrated into really the subtext of the novel. And when I was writing the book, what I tried to create was the kind of story that people could read from one cover to the next and think, oh, I got the story. But if you want to look more deeply, there will be things there for you. You know, I haven't set this novel up to kind of tease you into thinking that it's not worth looking more deeply. It is. <laughs> 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 um, so that as one of the subtexts of the book, um, it is about what do we consider important? Mm. How do we as a nation and how do we, and having worked in the media as well, I've had to make these decisions. What do I put, which um, federal cabinet minister do I put on my show as opposed to, you know, what story do I cover and what angle? And these decisions are being made all the time. So often what we find 
I think maybe this is part of human nature, but often what we find is that if something happens en masse, it attracts a great deal of attention. And the obvious example is the terrible murders at Port Arthur all those years ago. Mm. Even though in the years leading up to that, we'd had hundreds of people, you know, whose lives had been stolen from them by guns. Mm. But it took something like a single action for the gun laws in Australia to change. But also, and this was one, I was thinking this morning that um, this book changed me. Mm. I didn't just create this book. The book in so many ways created me. And one of the things I had to come to terms with as a white Australian, the racism in my own country. Mm. And it's not easy to do that. It really isn't easy. Mm. But we have to look. And if we look, it is everywhere. I said to Peter Gers on, on um, his show when he interviewed me last week that when you start to look at the actual texts of how I was educated in South Australia, I've only ever lived here, my family's been here 150 years. When I look at those old textbooks, the racism is there. Mm. When I look at what the leaders of my Catholic church said in even 10, 15 years before I was born, the racism is clear. They say things like um, Aboriginal people are uh, the lowest form of race. Mm. Mentally and physically, they're the lowest form of race. And it takes a lot of courage to look at that and say, well, what impact has that had on me as I was growing up? Mm. How did that inform my view of the world? And in fact, uh, um, you were talking, we were talking about the subtext, Joe, and one of the key things in the book is, is understanding that we have these blind spots. And the blind spots are there because of how we were educated, our mm -hmm. culture, um, what we were taught from the pulpit, whoever our religious leaders may be. Mm -hmm. And it isn't easy identifying that we have blind spots. It, that might make us say, well, perhaps my teachers weren't right. Perhaps my government wasn't right. Perhaps my Australian culture wasn't right. Mm. And yes, they're, they're very hard questions to ask and to answer. Mm. But I feel as if it's my duty as a citizen to ask them and to find the answers and to look. Mm. And I will be changed by that process, and I have been changed by it. <laughs> well, they say that all in all good writing is discovery, so... <laughs> That makes sense. Yes, certainly that. <laughs> um, one thing I found really interesting in the novel actually was um, the exploration. Um, Cassandra, as an adult, explores the question of why are we here, which she says she's exploring quite literally. Um, why are she and her ancestors in the place that they are, that they call home and have been for hundreds of years? And she looks into the history of her Irish ancestors' migration to Australia and see some connections between the Irish and Indigenous Australians. And some of that is in what you were just talking about in terms of the lang kind of language that was used to talk about them. Um, and I just want a, um, a tiny quote from Cassandra. She says, I'm thinking about invaders, the colonists here, the British in Ireland. I want similarities. I need similarities. Now, this is... This is um, not an uncomplex and um, nuanced exploration, but I wonder if you can talk a bit about that because I thought it was really fascinating. The the kind of about, uh, about uh, the commonality of invasion. Yeah, and <laughs> and the complexity of that. Um, yes, th this is an interesting kind of journey because there are similarities in how invaders behave throughout history. And um, I'm not a historian. My, my PhD was in creative writing. Um, I've always been fascinated by history and thinking uh, how did things eventuate and um, how, how have people been treated? And I was particularly fascinated by Nazi Germany. What took one of the nation's had some of the great philosophers, some of the great musicians, and turned it into such a brutal, um, extraordinary um, machine of horror. You know, how did that happen? How does an ordinary person become someone 
who would be a guard at a concentration or extermination camp? How does that happen? Are we all, do we all have that amount of evil in us? So I was thinking about the whole concept of invasion and, and shifts in culture and um, how does that happen? And there are similarities across history. And one of the keys is that the invaders um, must do is foster foster self-hatred amongst the people who've been victimised. Mm. So um, Thomas Keneally's assessment of Irish, of a section of Irish history is called the great shame mm. around the potato famine uh, and the migration that followed. I think two million people left Ireland, Canada, Australia and elsewhere. Mm. Um, so why do the colonised become why do they develop this sense of shame? And it's because the colonisers um, infuse in whatever way they can this sense that the colonised are inferior. You have been beaten. So therefore, you as people, you as your belief system, your culture, your art, everything about you is not as good as ours. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a universal sort of thing. It's quite horrid <laughs> when you think about it. But you can look at, when you look at history, you can see that that's what's happened. It certainly happened in Ireland. And it was interesting, I thought, that Keneally called it the great shame. And I draw similarities with what happens when a human psyche, a human heart and soul is colonised in a domestic violence situation. Yes because that's a kind of colonisation, as I said, of the heart and soul and mind. But it, the, the result is very similar to a national colonisation, and that is the person thinks in the end that, they're, um, that somehow they've been eroded, that um, their sense of self has gone, has been destroyed, and they have a sense of shame. And it's one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to write about that very... Um, interior experience of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show readers that um, that's the process that happens. And so when we hear people ask, why didn't she leave? It's that she can't, she cannot leave. Cassandra, children, pets, economic issues, not really. She has the means to get out, but she can't. And so that's in a really, um, in a way, in a life style that is very simplistic compared to the complexities of, say, um, a woman with two or three children who's reliant economically on her male partner for survival. None of those factors are with Cassandra. And yet um, I would challenge any reader to say, why doesn't she leave after having read that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's one of the things that's really powerful about this book is the way that it explores systemic um systemic uh systemic issues and systemic um oppression but also domestic oppression and the way that um issues uh systemic issues play out in just within the home so and i thought that um i've read jess hill's wonderful book on domestic uh violence uh see what you made me do in the last year and having read that and then read your book um, I would agree that it, it really um, perfectly captures the, um, the complexities of the lived experience of domestic violence. And, and that it's um, I th one thing that I thought was really um, fantastic about the way you portray it is that it's so often, um, it's about a fierce, quick, possessive love that looks like romantic passion at first, but reveals itself to be about ownership and control. Um, so I thought you really got that disparity between how it can look and then how it suddenly actually is. Um, can you talk a bit about the kind of uh, research that you did to underpin that portrayal? I know that you have some background in covering domestic violence. Um, yes, that's such a big question. And <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I can start. <laughs> I'll start with saying that as a child coming into consciousness mm -hmm. and then I lived in a relatively safe household. So this isn't my experience as a child or, mm -hmm. or anything like that, but I was just so incredibly shocked as I started to hear how women and children were treated by men. I just mm -hmm. thought, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> why isn't there, 
why don't we just put up with it? I mean, what, what, mm. what can we do about it? How, um, one of the things that I, I tried to do, I was talking about shame a few minutes ago. Um, what I was trying to do in that section about um, how Cassandra is caught in the web uh, with a violent man is, um, now how could I put this? Um, I was trying to show that while we as a nation and as a world, we can't tomorrow stop the violence against women and children in the home. Mm. What I'm hoping that this story will do is to at least attack some of the shame that the, the victims feel. Mm. So they will tell their friends. They will tell supportive relatives to agencies and not feel shame we can help cut through that part mm. because women don't fall in love with violent men they fall in love with men who are hiding their violence they mm. fall in love with a mirage and often that mirage has been very very carefully constructed one young woman said to me um, they know what to say Annette they simply know what to say Mm -hmm. So when the first act of violence happens, that, and he says, I'm sorry, that'll never happen again. That's not the promise he will keep. That's the flag to her to say, this is just the beginning. Yeah. This is just the beginning of the violence. This is the first one. And if we can cut through and, um, and encourage women at that point to seek help and support, and stop the secrecy. We might have some hope of mm -hmm. cutting through, you know, the terrible numbers that are in hospital today and will be in hospital tomorrow because of, of the violence. Now, getting back to the research, in 1984 was my first year as an ABC trainee broadcaster and the chance to make documentaries. So um, I had special permission and I went off to a women's shelter in the country. Mm -hmm. No one had ever done this kind of thing before in South Australia. And so I went off with my tape recorder and I recorded the women's stories after having gone through this. I remember the door opening and there were bars on the window and an intercom. And the women in there told me their stories with such honesty and openness. It just took my breath away, really. And one I've never forgotten, she, she had... Um, a ruptured spleen. She'd been in hospital for weeks with her various injuries. And she looked at me and she said, he was so sorry. And he promised he'd never do it again. Mm. And for a year, he was really good. But then he broke his promise. Uh. <laughs> so um, they had broken bones and they had broken hearts. Mm. And so this is what I'm trying to get at in the first part of the book is to cut through that silence and the shame in the very early stages. Mm -hmm. So someone can ring up their friend and say, he hit me last night. He to took create a bit of empathy for the experience so people can, might feel that they can speak about it and you're also setting up people to be able to hear about it perhaps. Yes, because it was a mirage she fell in love with. He was never the person that she fell in love with. And that is a really hard thing to say when we, we strive to have love in our lives. Yes, and, yeah, and the loss the of it. Thing. It's really, it, this is not an easy path, but mm -hmm. we can support each other and erode that sh the shame associated with domestic violence. We can at least do that. Mm -hmm. Thank the rest you. is political. You know, we need parliaments to do more and all the rest of it. And um, we have so many advocates talking about that. What I did do, um, not long before publication, I contacted, um, a contact was put onto me who'd worked in the domestic violence field for 40 years. And I asked her to read the first 40 or so pages, I won't say exactly how long, but the, um, the first section to see if I'd missed anything. Mm -hmm. And it was really important that I had that feedback from her. Mm -hmm. Really important. Were and again, any, over the years... I've been, were there any changes you made in response to that feedback? Or? I added two sentences. Oh, wow. 
but she's no she was she was very very supportive i was really touched i was quite moved to tears when i got her email so i thought i'm um, i'm getting closer i you know i wanted it to be as accurate as i could possibly make it the other thing i want to say about the research and um fran kelly mentioned this when she launched my book um about how we in the media we cover these horrendous stories and then people are really shocked when we bring yet another appalling act of violence by men against women and children to you know the national exposure through the media i cannot tell you how many times in my career on and off in the media over 30 years that i've read missing person notices for a child or for a woman and then I have the police on, you know, two weeks later or three weeks later, and we find out what's happened to them. Mm. And that's just, that is just part of what we do. And they're headlines for a few days, and then it goes away. And then some other appalling act will be back on the front pages for a few days. Yeah. And as I said, we can't stop it today and we won't stop it tomorrow. In fact, Jess Hill is very worried about the fact that domestic violence calls at the moment have declined. Oh. They've declined because women are too frightened to pick up the phone because their male partners are at home with them. So in some countries, I think France has introduced it, where they have a code now. Oh, okay. They actually have a code. I think you can go to a chemist shop with a code. Mm. Uh, and there might idea. even be phone services that are using it. Um, mm. I think Jess was saying something about possibly we should considering that in Australia right now. So domestic violent calls have gone down while we've been in um, all in our homes. Uh, and yet the number of men ringing up for support services because they're afraid that they're going to be violent or are being violent have actually increased. That tells a story, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. So why are we in a culture where uh, it is so violent is another question. That's another book. That's a huge question <laughs> for a different event, perhaps. Um, absolutely. Maybe you and Jess Hill one day. <laughs> um, I, I think that, I mean, we keep coming back to that idea of, of silence. Um, and I think that that, that idea of silence and uh, not speaking out about things or hiding things, keeping them in, is something that um, runs across the novel in various different ways. And one that I thought was really touching and interesting was um, Cassandra's relationship with her father and that when she goes back to uh, her hometown to nurse him um, when he's dying, um, she perhaps gets to know him a little bit better in some ways, perhaps because his defences are a little down. And she wonders whether some of his secrets are full of grief. She starts to question what she's always seen as his indifference and to see it as perhaps something a bit more nuanced, um, possibly sometimes a defence against feeling, I thought. Um, and I thought that that, um, that aspect of the novel felt like a really poignant comment on traditional masculinity and the demands, the damage that its demands of stoicism does to men as well as to women. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, I was reminded, and I think I mentioned this in the novel, um, about, oh, I'm having a Teflon moment, uh, the <laughs> wonderful Australian artist who did the, the triptych of the pioneer and the arm of the man is illuminated. He <laughs> is called, you, people will, will know this, the first one is they, he and her, a, a young couple arrive in a forest and I think she's got a baby on her lap. Oh, and yeah. then in one of the panels, he's there with an ax, but his arm is illuminated. And I mentioned earlier about that whole concept of the colonists trying to survive. Mm. So physicality was the trait most admired and it was most admired in men because it meant that you had a better chance of surviving. It was that basic. Mm. So... Um, I grew up with the idea, and this was not just in my family, but it was quite common. You don't want anyone going soft. You don't want the dog going soft. <laughs> dog. You don't want your mate down the road going soft. <laughs> um, and the idea is because uh, in order to survive, to keep going, a lot of, and there were incredible griefs. You look at any of the old cemeteries in the and you'll see a family of children wiped out through diphtheria. 
mm. or the damage done by polio when polio went through in the 50s um, mm. in country South Australia. Um, so the emphasis and the celebration was all about physicality. Mm. And I think this, it's an interesting idea, but perhaps that's why we love sports mm. so much because it's the same thing from the time uh, my ancestors arrived and colonization began. It was all about who was going to survive and who, who wouldn't survive. The toughest, the strongest, they survived, the others didn't. Mm -hmm. And then we, so sport is really a continuation of that celebration, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and no, <that's> we, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the cost of that on men has been huge, mm -hmm. absolutely huge. Um, it wasn't easy for me growing up being a writer in a small country town. Mm -hmm. But I happened to be playing A-grade sport by the time I was 14, 15. Mm. So the contrast for me was right there. You know, all the wonderful, and I'm so grateful, the pats on the back I got for playing sport, mm. you know, tennis and netball, all the rest of it, compared to the secrecy I had around you know, <laughs> this deviant behaviour of being a writer and a poet. And you know, <laughs> don't want too many people to know about that. <laughs> really? It would have been seen with suspicion or you just yes, felt... Yes, yeah. exactly. So I hid I hid a lot of my writing but I have tried to imagine what how much more difficult for men incredibly difficult to show that kind of sensitivity and um, in a with a community uh, culture and consciousness that said you know you're too soft you know you, you, you they won't fit in and I, I really do feel feel that and I think for my gen and I've spoken spoken to um, other women around my age group and many of us, not all, but some of us, uh, many of us have had quite a challenged and problematic relationship with our fathers mm. because we were the generation that benefited from the second wave of feminism. So no wonder we went into the workforce in the 80s with ginormous <laughs> Joan, Joan Collins. <laughs> Had its shoulders. <laughs> we are here, guys. <laughs> we needed those padded shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Only you had a photo to show us in it. <laughs> but you see, for our father's generation, they were brought up where it was the men that did everything. My grandmother didn't even have a bank account, you know, all the years of her married life. It was the men that often ran the households. They just gave their wives so much money for. Uh, looking after you know the shopping and that was it everything else all the decisions were made by men so here were my father's generation and us young women who wow Gough Whitlam opened the universities we're off <laughs> <laughs> well, especially so, I guess for young women for women like you who had this secret you know bookish side you were hiding you I know <laughs> I, I know I got to university and I thought oh my goodness I, I can study poetry and get the marks <laughs> ordered degree this is amazing so um having spoken to to many women in my age group and older um the relationships do have a kind of tension around that because we weren't meant to have these lives and then our fathers and and uh, uncles had to kind of recalibrate their thinking if they could, but still against all of this community pressure saying, you know, a woman's place is in the home and what are these young girls doing? You know, going off and wanting to study politics like me. <laughs> politics <laughs> and English, where was that going to get me? <laughs> it used to be funny because I worked in a shop in my hometown for a year to save up money to go to university and the locals would come in and say aren't we good enough for you Annette why are you oh, leaving you know, <laughs> universities are filled with drugs <laughs> you know what are you doing <laughs> first time I saw unusual <laughs> for you to go to university then or were there others of your generation doing that then well, I was the first in my family to get mm. to university. My parents didn't even get to high school, but they were, um, uh, and I, I kind of allude to this, those ideas in the book. That wasn't unusual either. Mm. It was more unusual if you did get to high school in my parents' generation. So, and I have a doctorate. That's what edu free education access has done for me. You know, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. I just... Mm be born at the right time that's the difference between myself and my parents just for mm. a different era um, so that whole relationship with fathers um contains these tensions 
but you're not meant, why are you going off studying? You're meant to learn how to run a home. You're meant to learn how to be a mother. You're, you're meant to stay nearby for when we grow old. And um, so that's the kind of thinking that uh, I think permeated a lot of those relationships. So, so two yeah. completely different definitions of what it is to be a woman and then just kind of a, a lack of understanding between the two. And I think I think a lot of men and women, for that matter, in that generation, in my parents' generation and above, didn't understand why we wanted to do it. Mm, mm, mm. And then, um, about 10, 15 years ago, talking to a lot of older women in their, that were then in their 90s, they carried, some of them I spoke to carried a lot of rage. Really? And they were saying... We believed what we were told was mm. our role and we live that role and now we see you having a different life and we can't help thinking we wished we'd had it. We wow. wished we had those chances, mm. um, you know, make the most of it, the most generous ideas. And a lot of the women were very generous in their old age as they looked at what we were having and the kind of lives we were having that were much richer and bigger and more self-fulfilling. Um, the most generous ideas were, I'm so glad it finally happened. But then on the other end of the spectrum was, um, you'd better make the most of it because I didn't get it. You know, and you could see the disappointment in the long lines from the ends of the mouths. Yeah, wow. The disappointment mm. that, you know, they didn't get that opportunity. And it's made me even more driven in my life to think, well, I better make the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really positive outcome. That's a positive <laughs> way of looking at it. And I think that, I mean, one of the beautiful things about the book is the fact that, um, that Dif different experience over generations of women and that idea of women having um, been suppressed in the past and um, of, and of, of Cassandra representing a, kind of a new kind of life that women can have and that, that's all uh, really rewarding to read about. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, now I think it's about time to open up to audience questions. Um, is that right? If not, I will keep on asking questions. But <laughs> Hi, Jo. Yes, that's correct. We do have a couple of questions that have come okay. in from our listeners already. So from Joy, she says, so interested in the idea of DV being like a process of colonisation. As a previous mental health therapist, this makes so much sense to me. Have you thought about sharing this insight with those working in this field? Um, that's why I wrote the book, seriously. Um, I'm hoping that people working in these fields will have a look at it. I'm hoping that uh, parents will buy it for their daughters, for their nieces, and I hope that the nieces and daughters will buy it for their mothers and stepmothers. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I do. Um, because it's, as I said earlier, um, Joy, and thank you for your question, that idea about the shame, we can, as, as a collective, we can actually attack that. We can attack it and say, there is no need to feel shame. What you fell in love with didn't exist. You have been taken over by um, a, a power that is greater than what you are. You were vulnerable and the power exploited that vulnerability. And just as colonisation, there is a kind of war. And uh, let me put it this way. I was talking to a woman one day um, she was in her 50s and she'd been with the same partner for 20 something years. She told me in all seriousness, she went to her doctor and said, I'm physically disappearing. Mm. I'm actually physically disappearing, not just in my mind. And I want you to check that my body is still here. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, ugh. Just gets me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. And um, so we see, we see the impacts on, well, I particularly looked at the Irish because I have some Irish ancestry, I also have German ancestry, but I looked at, um, I'd always been interested in that Irish story. Um, also, they produced some great Nobel 
uh, winners of literature, Nobel Prize winners of literature. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, you know, I, I love, I love the Irish writing, you know, Yeats and so forth. So um, I wanted to look look at that, and I, of course, I mentioned earlier about that idea of. Um, coming to terms with the racism in Australia. That was the other reason I had to look at colonisation. I can, I could not in all honesty say, I want to write about my love for the landscape mm. on far, um, where I was brought up on a farm that had been cleared in order to pay for everything I ever needed. Mm. How can I do that and not acknowledge the Nukuna people who um, two years ago, were finally granted by the federal court um, native title over the Southern Flinders. Mm -hmm. And I, and I um, them and uh, the Ghana people for the two main areas where the novel is set, uh, there is an acknowledgement to those, to the people um, in the book. So I, um, that idea of the colonization joy of the mind and the colonization of land in the end through my research and my thinking almost became inseparable. And as I was looking more and more at the spiritual and um, psychological colonization um, by a domestic violence perpetrator, I couldn't help but see similarities. So. I do want people to share this book. I do, that's why I wrote it. <laughs> I do, I want them to read about it and maybe th consider what, what, I, what the book says about shame, what it says about isolation and, and ultimately what it says about friendship and love and how those things save us and they save us over and over as does the natural world save us over and over. Great. Uh, the next question is from an anonymous attendee and they would like to know, how did you choose the title for your book? <laughs> yes. It, let me tell you, it, it had many titles over the years. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what they were. <laughs> um, how did I choose the title? Um, I was really struggling with the idea of the title. I couldn't, I couldn't find one that just sort of settled and every year or so I'd change it again. And then one day, this, this seems very, very tray ordinaire, but it's actually what happened. Um, I thought I'd Google it. <laughs> how, to, how to come up with a title for your novel. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever it was, you know, just had three or four questions to ask. And I went, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> so I went through the three or four questions with my own book and I thought oh there it is that's it that so is what were the questions oh, I can't remember now <laughs> you'll have to google it Joe. okay <laughs> and our anonymous um questioner no but that's honestly what happened and I was so excited I thought this is it this actually really is it because mm. I knew that um it had the poetry in the title that I wanted it had the ambiguity the kind of mystery that I wanted and most of all and most of all it summarized the entire heart of the book and that is about um, this place becoming home in all the the books in so many ways talks about the nature of home in all of our you know we talk about home as in we're we're in them now but then and people overseas talked about going home and they didn't mean their, you know, their flat or their unit or their house or their farm. They meant Australia. So home is a very, very, it's a big word. Mm. And uh, so it fitted all of the key themes of the book. So honestly, I was so excited. <laughs> I couldn't wait to tell somebody. So I, I told one of the people in my writers group that I finally had the title. It was a wonderful moment. <laughs> people have seemed to have liked the title and that's that's lovely I w i've wanted people to like it but it had to be true it's to a the wonderful book. title yep um <laughs> the next question or it's an observation more of an observation she says really is from terry and she says it is interesting that you wrote your book pre-coronavirus and you talk about the importance of the natural world now at this time of crisis the world is turning more and more to the natural world with people walking and needing to be in nature growing vegetables, etc. This seems to be so important at this time. The natural world is integral to healing. Do you think or hope 
that this crisis will be a turning point for the world to turn and learn more from nature? Oh, yes, I, Terry, absolutely, with my whole heart. We are lost without it. I've often said, when we use the term the environment, what do we mean? The environment for me is the air of my next inhalation, my next breath. That's how far the environment is away from me and from you and from us all. And similarly, the water is, you know, what's coming through my tap. It's not something obscure. Um, growing up where we had a rainwater tank, you know, every, the resources that we needed were actually right by us. And I think what's happened is a very urbanised um, culture we have now, and Australia, one of the most urbanised countries in the world. Um, I'm hoping that as people realise that, that we need it so desperately, we need it like our breath and the water. I mean, we do. Um, so I don't, I've never seen the environment as being an abstract concept, but something that is integral, integral to every moment of my being that gives me life. And that's what it does. I, I'm, I started a campaign some time ago about land clearing in Australia. We're now on a par with Brazil's land clearing of the Amazon. It's that bad. We have 2,000 species looking at extinction if we're not careful. And it's not as if we've said, okay, we needed this to survive. We forgive our ancestors for doing this. They didn't know any better. They thought the resources and they saw them as resources too. The resources of Australia were infinite. But we know now they're not. We know that all these species are in trouble. We know the barrier, Great Barrier Reef made about story number five or six the other day with one of the worst bleachings in its history. And it's not even the top story anymore. You know, we're the top story. Not, <laughs> I, I just find all of this quite extraordinary, really. Um, one of da Vinci's uh, famous drawings of, of forgotten the name of it now, another Teflon moment, but um, of the naked man, you know, with the diagram. Yes. I can't help but think Vinci was saying that that was a comment on humans thinking we're the centre of absolutely everything. Mm. So there are so many wise people. Uh, David Attenborough has said it um, about how we are no more important than other species. Dr. Jane Goodall has said, um, we are not the only species that love, grieve, that feel pain or joy. So what gives us the right to exterminate them in the name of economics? Not to survive, not that kind of economics. The economics that says this is our third investment house or this is mm. our swimming pool because we don't want to use the one down the road. We want one in our backyard or whatever it might be. I mean, I'm not, not being judgmental here. I'm a human too. You know, we, we want things. Isn't it time we stopped? Well, we are stopped. We have stopped now and reassessed and said, but what really matters? And what we're finding what matters is human connection. Human action. What matters is our access to our parklands, to forests, that's what matters. So I, I hope with all my heart, Terry, that this is a time where we recalibrate our thinking. And as I said earlier, um, the natural world is not included in our national accounts. And yet one Victorian academic said many years ago, every tree is worth thousands and thousands of dollars if you actually gave it an economic value. And yet we chop them down as in a capitalist society if they, as if they have no value. But um, I think their value is far beyond the economics, as I've said earlier. And if you, if you um, want to know more, read the book <laughs> 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 about that. <laughs> well, thanks, I mean, yeah, a question, sorry, uh, here, Annette, from Jen. So Jen says, I remember meeting with a group of young Aboriginal women in Adelaide Women's Prison and their shock and sadness and despair when I talked about the fact that I was brought up to be racist by parents and teachers who were otherwise kind people. It has stayed with me forever. How have you connected with the Aboriginal community to write your book and how did it impact on you? I grew up with Aboriginal people around me. Not a lot, but they were there. As a white writer, I didn't set out to tell an Aboriginal story. Aboriginal people, 
can tell their own stories and are doing it brilliantly. Um, um, Tara, again, Teflon moment, is in the shortlist for Tara us. Uh, yeah. I read Swallow the Air several years ago, um, her award-winning book, and it was stunning. So I, I never set out to write an Aboriginal story. And in fact, um, I was very cautious about trying not to do that. So the stories, the Aboriginal stories remain Aboriginal stories. What my book is, is a white perspective on the violence that a white character was seeing in her own community. And I see that as, if you can imagine it, as intersecting circles. So this is the white experience, this is the Aboriginal experience. My book is about where they intersect. So um, one of my... Um, one of the people I loved as a child was Sister Antoinette, who was a Josephite nun. And I didn't go to a Catholic school, but they used to visit for religious instruction once a week. And she um, told us that she was Indian. She had darker skin. We loved it a bit. We thought she was sort of saint-like. <laughs> and um, I found out many years later from another Josephite nun I'd kept in contact with that she'd found out that she was Aboriginal and went in search of her family. As a white writer, I can write a book that has no Aboriginal people in it. So I not only have been part of the culture and legal system that obliterated them from law in terra nullius, I didn't want the equivalent in a book. I couldn't do that. I would rather get it wrong and say, I've got it wrong because I was brought up with a racist education and I'm trying to tear it down in my own mind. But that doesn't mean I've been successful. It just means I'm trying. I didn't want to obliterate the Aboriginal presence from, from the reality of, especially seeing my book is set in country, South Australia. How could I do that? that would be, it would be false. It would make the whole story wrong and I couldn't do that. The other curious thing about the process of writing is that I didn't structure, even though it's a crime fiction novel, I didn't structure it so on a whiteboard to say this character is here and this is going to happen. It, um, some of the plot came to me in dreams, some of the plot, unfolded as I was writing. On the first day that um, five-year-old Cassie starts school, I didn't know as she was walking through the gate that the first person she would meet would be a little girl called Tanya. I didn't know that. I just saw her in my mind as clear as anything going through that gate, and but that's who she met. And sometimes writing had mystery about it and I remember Billy Connolly the comic saying when people asked him you know how do you do it Billy he didn't want to analyze it too much he said it might take something away from me mm -hmm. so what I do I acknowledge to you today that there were elements of the writing of this book that I don't understand that happened and that's the way it was as part of the process the assessment and the analytical part is always there as well. And that's why I said about the intersecting circles, because the analytical part of me needed to explain how, I, how this was being created. So the intersecting circles was my way of thinking about it. Mm. But there is still, there is still mis in there. Um, yes, I will say some of one or two of the dreams in the book are real, but I'm not going to tell you which ones. <laughs> <laughs> I guess when we read, will we? <laughs> so I hope that's answered. Was it Jen? I hope that's answered the question as best I can, Jen. Is um, I didn't want to, I couldn't write a book honestly about country South Australia without and obliterate the Aboriginal presence. I, I just couldn't do that. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions from our listeners, but I'm not sure if you have any more, Jo. I could talk to Annette for another hour, but <laughs> people probably have things to do. So <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think, I think I'll leave it at this as a very fulfilling hour of conversation, but- um, It certainly has been. Well, thank you so no, much, oh, sorry. Can I add one thing? Have I got time to add one thing? Certainly. Sure. Um, at one point in the 
story, I needed a song for, uh, that was carried through the generations of Irish that came to Australia so that uh, they would sing in their household. And I went looking for songs and I thought, I don't know if I can be bothered with copyright. So I wrote the lyrics myself, <laughs> which are in the book. And then because, just because I thought it would be fun, I thought, what if someone actually put it to music? So I approached Anna O'Neill, who records in West Australia as Anna O. She took it into the studio and gave it full, this is actually true, full studio production, wrote music to it. And we've released it as a song. If you want to hear it, you can just go to my website and we've got the, the trailer. I made a trailer of the book just for fun. And, um, uh, and the song there is the soundtrack. But it, we actually released it as a song. <laughs> so there you go. You just don't know. And I love that idea of just connecting with the other, other creatives and just, you know, seeing what we can make. But yeah. what she did with it and Sam Wilde, what they did with my lyrics is just incredibly beautiful. I, I just couldn't believe what they'd done. So that's just another little aspect of the creative process that I've been involved in. Oh, that's great. I think I'm going to go and check out that song when we finish here. It is beautiful. Thank you so much, Annette, for joining us this morning and sharing your fascinating, touching and insightful, and in your words, fruit smoothie of a book. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, a very difficult subject. It sounds like a must read and a must share for all South Australians or Australians, really, both women and men. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Jo, also for your time today interviewing Annette. And um, we have had a couple of replies to your replies to people's questions saying that they can't wait to read your book. So um, if you are, if you did miss it earlier, um, your, Annette's book can be bought online because um, we obviously can't visit our libraries and our bookstores at the moment at Imprints Booksellers and they are www.imprints.com.au and they can deliver for you. So thank you once again and please keep following the Marion Library's Facebook page to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations and workshops. And if you haven't already registered, this Thursday we welcome uh, Wakefield Press young YA author Poppy Noisu, who talks about her new book, Taking Down Evelyn Tate. So keep an eye on your Facebook or your inbox on how to register. And thank you again, Annette and Jo, and have a great day and stay safe. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay. <laughs>